Pentecost? Why not some of the other holidays during the church year? Why did they pick Christmas to be the one they would change into this worldwide celebration and take it some places that the church just couldn't follow but have stayed traditionally anyway? Why Christmas? Well, I think it is the story of the shepherds that give us insight. It's the experiences of the shepherd that give us insight as to the appeal of Christmas and the Christmas season. So let's look at those this morning. Number one, Christmas is appealing because it shares with us the involvement of the divine. It lets us know that God is near. Amen. We look at what happened with them. Verse 9, verse 8, we're told they were in their fields watching their flocks by night. Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. And the angel said, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. In that very instance, the shepherds who are out in the fields, they're doing their daily work, they're involved in their daily activities, God steps in into that environment. And it's a reminder that God is always near, that God is close. The proximity of the divine, the involvement of the divine in our daily life is celebrated during the Christmas season. And we look at that instance where the angel appeared, verse 9, and then down to verse 13. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. The appearance of the angels and the proximity of the divine, the involvement of God in our lives has been captured in some of the songs that we sing in this Christmas season. In fact, we see these invaders from the invisible realm spoken of in songs. Oh 
each of those carols, the ministry of the angels is magnified. They have come to bring a message from the Lord. That is their role. That is what the word angel means. It's a messenger from God. And so they brought a message to the shepherds that says God is involved in your lives. God is where you are and he has come to meet you and he's brought you this message that is going to be good news for all the people that today in the town of David a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah. For the angels, their messages were relevant. They were current. They were in, in due time. They were right where the people needed to hear at that moment. The shepherds were out in the fields keeping watch over the flocks, and God went into that place. The angels appear and bring a message of relevance. It's a current event, and it gives them something to do right then and there. It gives them something to understand, but it gives them an action to follow. Whenever God speaks to us, and whenever God invades our lives, when God becomes involved, he gives us understanding, he gives us action, he gives us a way to know him. The message of the angels on that night was a relevant message. Amen. The message of the angel that night was a righteous message. It guided people to the will of God, and it guided people to the worship of God. Amen. It guided people to the fact that God had sent a Savior. He sent the Messiah, and the shepherds could go find him. It gave them something to do. And then when they saw the child, the Bible says, they spread wide what they had been told, and they left. They returned to their fields, praising and rejoicing Amen. for all they had seen. Amen. Because it was just as they had been told. The message Amen. that they heard was that God is involved in your life. That God has come to meet you where you are. It was a relevant message and it was a righteous message. Yeah. And we think about how the angels arrived at that point. They didn't walk. They didn't fly. Amen. They didn't come on a magic carpet or a metallic spaceship. They simply appeared. Amen. It's often surmised that the veil between the living and the dead is thinnest at Halloween. But the Christmas story, the story of Jacob and his vision of the ladder, the stories of Mary and Joseph are simply a reminder that God is everywhere present, that God is always in our midst, and those angels, whenever he desires to send us a message, they can appear without warning. Amen. They are always around, and they bring us that message that is relevant, that is righteous. They bring us the message that God is always nearby. In fact, the angels that appear in the Christmas story, they remind us that God is near. And there are times like today, there are times like this weekend, that we need to know that God is near. The angels bring the message that God is aware of what's going on. It's a message that a Savior has come. It's a message of the Messiah. Those things for the Jewish people were looking forward to. That's right. And God says they are here. It's a message that he is near. It's a message that he is aware. It is a message that he is involved. The same message that he gave to Moses in the burning bush. The same message that he gave to Daniel during his time of tribulation. The same message he gave to the Daniel's three Hebrew friends that were in the fiery furnace. God is near, God is aware, and God is involved. Amen. What is the appeal of the Christmas story? It's that God is involved in our lives. The proximity of the divine. We also learn the second appeal of the Christmas story is the innocence of the Christ child. Verse 11 says... Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Let's go to verse 16. So the shepherds hurried off and wow. found Mary and Joseph and the, the Jewish baby people actually still who was lying for the first coming in a manger. Instead of the no one coming. is afraid of a baby. Amen. No one. Now, some people are afraid of becoming parents, but no one <laughs> is afraid of a baby. <laughs> and who can resist the giggle of an infant? And who can resist the serenity that surrounds a baby when he or she is sleeping? The innocence of the Christ child makes him appealing. And that's also been captured in the songs that we sing. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round your virgin mother and child. Oh, 
concerning what had been told to them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them, which may have led them to ask this question. What child is this who to rest on Mary's lap and see? Amen. Amen. The innocence is the same. He poses no threat. He makes no demands. He is simply the love of God incarnate as he hangs on the cross, the love of God he has for his creation. Because when you think about the story of the crucifixion, do you at any point in time ever hear Jesus shouting insults towards the Roman government who was put in there? At any point in time during the crucifixion, do you hear him raging at the crowd who supported his crucifixion and the exchange for Barabbas that left him in that place to be crucified? In the story of the crucifixion, do you ever hear Jesus utter anything in anger? Mm -mm. You think about the statements he made while hanging on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they, they do. They don't know what they're doing. That's right. Amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken Amen. me? And into thy hands I commit my spirit. There is not one ounce of anger. There is not one ounce of hatred. There is not one ounce of anything other than the joy that was set before him for the redemption that would come through his death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. The innocence of the baby is the same as the innocence of the man on the cross. And we can say with all certainty that the way Jesus enters our world and the way that he exits our world is the same. He is innocent. He is righteous. Amen. In fact, the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for became us. Became sin for, for us, us that we might become the righteousness of God, of God in him. Yeah. It's the innocence of the Christ child. That makes Christmas appealing. And it's the same innocence of Jesus on the cross. But we get to the third appeal of Christmas, and that is the invitation to the Savior. Verse 10, the shepherds receive this message. Do not be afraid is the first thing they're told. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. And this will be a sign. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. But you go back to verse 8. You realize the angels are living out in the fields and they're keeping watch over their flocks at night when this message comes. 
You realize the message that God delivers, this message of eternal significance, this message of a Savior, this message of a Messiah, does not go to a place with an established heritage. This message of a Savior, this message of a, of a Messiah, does not go to a place with religious significance. It's God reaching into their world, making his presence known. And he invites them to respond without obstruction, he invites them to respond without hesitation. He invites them to respond without interference. He invites them to respond without any kind of barrier in their way. You see, from the perspective of the parents, the manger represents inconvenience. <laughs> the Bible tells us there was no room for them in the end. There wasn't a place for them to say that the city of Bethlehem was so crowded because of the taxation requirement, there was no hospitable place for them to stay. And so the only place that was available was a stable with a manger. Not a crib, not a room, not a bed, but a manger. manger. For the parents, the manger represents inconvenience. For the shepherds, the manger represents accessibility. Amen. They could get there. Amen. And that's part of the invitation that they are offered. We know that they were considered unclean because of the profession they had, which means they couldn't get to a house, they couldn't get to a temple, but they could make it to a stable. Amen. They could get to where he was. God did not ask them to go into these other places of restriction. He put his son where everyone could find him. Amen. An open invitation. In fact, the shepherds would have felt at ease. The shepherds would have felt at home going into that place. And we learn that they received and rejoiced Amen. and reported and repeated the message that the Messiah has come. Amen. Their song may have sounded like this. on the mountain. places if the church has lost that sense of inclusivity. If we've lost that sense of including and inviting those who would need to know the story of the Messiah. And I realize there are reasons where it may be the resilience of sin in our world. Not just the existence or the presence of sin in our world, but the resilience of sin in our world. The fact that it just won't go away. Mm. It's always there and it seems to be increasing and becoming more creative and every day brings a new challenge and things that we would not even have imagined five or ten years ago are now putting, being put at our doors and we're having to deal with them. Yeah. It's the resilience of sin in our world that maybe makes people hesitant to come to the church because of that sense of conviction. Maybe it's the resistance to conviction by church members. Hmm. You look at the story of the shepherds, they were given the message God had come into their world and had spoken to them. Verse 16 says, they hurried. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. They hurried. Maybe we as the body of Christ lack that sense of urgency. Maybe we lack that sense of haste, that sense of we've got to go now and we put off. Even when the Lord is speaking to us and the sense of conviction comes over us, we hesitate. Whereas the shepherd hurried. 
to find out what God was doing. Maybe it's a decreasing reliance on the Spirit with regard to evangelism. We get so wrapped up in are we saying the right things, or are we going <laughs> to present it correctly, or is there something going to be, and we forget that it's the work of the Spirit that draws people to know. Amen. It's the work of the Spirit. And so you look at the story of the shepherds. They had simply repeated what they had been told. The Bible says in verse 16, they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had to tell them. And Mary treasured and pondered these things in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen. Amen. Just as they had been told. They simply spread the word. Mm. You look at the story of the parable of the sower. And we focus a lot on where that seed lands. Some lands on the pathway and it's going to be taken away by the birds. Some lands among the thorns and gets choked out. Some lands upon the rocks and has no root. And some lands in good soil. We focus on the soils. But the idea is the sower is not going by and dropping those seeds into a <laughs> hole. He's just spreading it. Amen. Amen. It falls where it falls. That's right. It's an open invitation. An invitation for all to come. The angel says that the good news of great joy will be for all the people. Amen. It's an open invitation. So what is it that makes Christmas appealing? It's the involvement of God in our lives. It's the innocence of the Christ child who's also the innocence of the man on the cross. Yeah. And it's that open invitation without obstruction, hesitation, interference, or barrier. We can all get there. So this morning, I wonder who needs to respond to the appeal of Christmas. Amen. Not having seen it that way, not understood what the Christmas story is all about, who needs to make that decision to say, I want to experience the love of God as it's presented in that way? Or who simply needs to return to the simplicity of Christmas? We can make it turn into something it was never intended to be. That's right. The story of reflection upon a Christ child being born, the Messiah coming. We get wrapped up in the parties and the presents and all the performances and all that goes, and we get off track That's from right. what it's supposed to be. That's right. A simple message. Who needs to respond to the simple message of Christmas? And who simply needs to spread the word? Amen. They've heard, you've heard, you've seen. Everything has turned out just as the Bible described, the sense of conviction and the forgiveness and the redemption that's all in these pages, you walk through every single one of those. And now you simply need to tell that's the right. world, knowing that at this time, hearts are open and receptive to the gospel. Yeah. Can we pray together? Amen. Father, we thank you for the time of worship, for those who had wisdom of old and were able to put the truth of your message into words that we could sing, that we could read. But Father, I pray this morning that we would see through all of those things and look at the innocent child you sent into our world, who looks like us, who lived like us, and Father, who died like us. Father, I pray for those who are being drawn this morning. Give them courage to say yes, Lord. To say, I want to be where you are. And Father, let us hurry to that place. You are sovereign, you are loving, you are gracious. And we are in your presence simply because you have invited us. Work in our hearts now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's say that we're going to sing, What Child Is This? What child is this?
receive our offering this morning. 